Hey there, everybody. Pete Pardo here from Sea of Tranquility. Welcome to another edition of our Questions and Answers show. Today is Saturday, June the 1st. Christ, we're like mid-year already. This scary stuff. Scary stuff. Time is going by way too quick. And going by quickly, it's been like three weeks since we did our last Q&A show. So uh, here we have another one. I picked out a uh, little more than a handful of questions from the last couple of weeks from you guys. And I'm going to tackle them one at a time here. So hopefully you dig what you hear. Some good questions this time around. If you didn't hear your question answered, probably means it's either something that's been asked before or it's way too in-depth for a show like this. Or it's like, you know, a one-word, one-sentence answer type of thing. I'm looking for stuff that kind of really makes me think and want to give like a, uh, you know, an engaging response, that sort of thing. So kind of keep that in mind. You can kind of tell the stuff I'm, I'm looking for by the, the ones that I'm answering here. So the first one is from Mark Williams. So Mark asks, hello, Pete, another great show. It seems to me that European metal is keeping metal alive way more than U.S. metal. I know it's not a contest, but the 80s U.S. metal scene was huge. The, you had the Big Four, Testament, Overkill, Metal Church, Sabotage, Fate's Warning, Death Angel, Exodus, just to name a few. It seems to me U.S. metal has taken a big step backwards of late, whereas European metal keeps moving forward. I'd like to see your thoughts. Well, you didn't really give much explanation as to how you think European metal is moving forward, because I think, quite frankly... Neither U.S. bands, metal bands, and I'm talking like, you know, younger bands, like from the last like 20 years or so. I don't think neither the U.S. bands nor the European bands are really doing much to move the genre forward. Okay, because I mean, look at look at some of the bands that have kind of popped up in the last 20 or so years on the U.S. side. You know, you got bands like Night Demon. All right. You know, who again, a lot of these bands I'm going to mention are revisiting older themes. Right. And that's fine. Night Demon doing like the new wave of British heavy metal thing. You know, you got Visigoth doing like the epic classic metal stuff. You know, Mastodon, prog metal, hardcore, that type of thing. Uh, Between the Buried and Me doing their, you know, kind of extreme progressive metal. Uh, Iced Earth. Okay, Lamb of God, Tool, Dream Theater, Disturbed, Avenged Sevenfold, Camelot, Redemption, Tremonti, Alter Bridge. I can go on and on. There's actually a lot of really good U.S. metal bands uh, of the last you know decade or two. <clears throat> now on the European side, you know you got bands like uh, you know Swedish bands, right? You know Norwegian bands, you know Ghost and. Amon Amarth and Opeth and It's Slaved, Amorphous, Seventh Wonder, Primordial, Haken, Arch Enemy, Dimmu Borgir, Children of Bodom, Behemoth, all right? A lot of extreme bands, a lot of European power metal bands, a lot of progressive bands. You know, the problem is none of these bands are really pushing the boundaries of anything, you know, other than a few. You know, you got, you know, Enslaved comes to mind. I mean, they're doing some really cool stuff, you know, blending classic prog rock with black metal. You know, a lot of, there's a lot of great bands on both sides. You know, the problem is I think to a lot of Americans, it seems like the U.S. metal scene is kind of dead because metal just isn't that huge here. It actually is still very big. People still buy the music. People still go to the shows. It's just not in the mainstream. You know, you look on the Billboard charts and all that kind of stuff. You know, there's no metal to be found anywhere. There's no festivals here. There's, you know, there's nothing, right? It's like you go see these bands in clubs and stuff. And other than the big, big bands, you know, the Metallicas and the Megadeths of the World and what have you, you know, they're all playing in clubs. Whereas in Europe, you know, metal seems like it's still alive and well. I mean, there's the, all the bands tour there. The festivals everywhere you look, okay? Album sales are healthy. Granted, it's, it's still not like top of the charts stuff. But it just seems a lot healthier because I think the European hard rock and metal fans embrace the music and some of the more casual listeners embrace the music more than they do here in the U.S. So I don't think it's, it's the fact that U.S. bands are taking a step backwards. I don't, I, don't really, I don't think there's a lot of difference between you know, where these bands are at, musically speaking, um, U.S. versus European. I, just, I think it's more the fans. I think the fans are to blame by what's going on here in the U.S. Seriously. You know, but a lot of the fans here, music fans in, in here in the U.S. for decades now are just like, you know, they jump on the, the hottest new thing. You know, one day they like metal, the next day they like rap and hip-hop, the next day they're listening to country. There's no real loyalty here. You know, except for some, a lot of the older listeners, you know, like myself. A lot of the younger crowd, man, they just jump on whatever the hell's fed down their throats, whatever's popular. So I honestly, I don't, I don't think you can blame the bands here. I really don't. 
Uh, and I don't see European metal really moving any more forward with their music than the U.S. bands are. It's just a matter of it's more accepted there. Okay. From Earl Joy. Pete, what's your take on the two versions of the Doobie Brothers? The Tom Johnston era versus the Michael McDonald era. I really dislike the Michael McDonald lead ver led version. Well, two completely different bands, right? The Tom Johnston led band was a rock and roll band. Okay. And a great one. And he's back at the helm. You know, he has been back at the helm for quite a while now, too, playing a lot of those classic stuff, classic albums and songs. Uh, the Michael McDonald era for those, you know, couple of albums there in the late 70s into the early 80s, a completely different beast. You know, they brought Michael McDonald in. He had the kind of smooth, soulful, jazzy voice. The music kind of took that direction. I think that's kind of where music in general was going in the late 70s into the 80s. People ate it up. All right. Everybody loved, you know, look what was popular back then. You know, the Eagles, you know, Steely Dan, that sort of thing. That kind of like California sound, that kind of jazzy, breezy, pop, country rock type of sound. I mean, you know, the, the, the Michael McDonald slotting in to the doobies and replacing Tom Johnston. It was ripe for, you know, minute by minute, what a fool believes and all that kind of stuff. I mean, that's people ate that shit up. But I think that over time. A lot of like classic and longtime Doobie Brothers followers and fans started to kind of see the blandness in that, right? Myself especially. And I remember being kind of swept up in that whole craze and really digging it. But now as, you know, an older listener who's been following the Doobie Brothers for a good chunk of my life, when I listen to the Doobie Brothers, I don't want to hear those albums for the most. They're still good. They're solid. But, man, I want to hear, you know, The Captain and Me and, and all those, those you know, Tolua Street and all, all that kind of stuff. Um, that's the stuff I want to hear. Those Tom Johnston albums. The rock and stuff, you know, that's it's just like really good hard rock and some folk and, you know, biker rock. All that just really good rock and roll music. That's what's really stood the test of time for me anyway. And, you know, it's no surprise that the band, you know, the band tours constantly now, play very little music from those Michael McDonald albums. Kind of telling, right? From Stephen Race. Hey, Pete, just curious. Have you heard or purchased the new Richie Blackmore's Rainbow album, The Storm? And if so, would you feature this new release on one of your new product review shows? Well, first of all, Stephen, it's not an album. All right, that's just a song they released. Uh, basically, The Storm is actually just an electrified remake of an old Blackmore's Night song from 2001 called Fires at Midnight. That's all it is. It's not an album. Rainbow's not doing a new album. All right, they, they did released one new song uh, last year sometime, which was okay. Uh, and this is okay. I, you know, I mean, Ronnie Romero sounds great. Um, he's a good singer. I find that the, uh, you know, the, so like I said, it's, it's an electrified version of a Blackmore's Night song, which is kind of like this little minstrel kind of folky thing. And here, you know, Richie adds some electric guitar and, you know, Ronnie's vocals are obviously a little more aggressive than Candace's, obviously. Uh, it's got some neoclassical feeling to it and everything like that. It's fine for what it is. As a rainbow song, eh, it's, it's got no riffs to it. It's not heavy at all. It's okay. Um, that's about really all I want to say. I mean, I, as you all know, I love Richie Blackmore to death. I am, you know, Richie's stuff in the late 60s, throughout the 70s, and the 80s, I absolutely adore. He's my favorite guitar player of all time. I've kind of lost interest in the Blackmore's Night stuff. It's just not really for me. And while I followed his little rainbow reunion and I've liked what they've done, you know, Richie's 70-something years old now. It's like, it's just not the same. I, I'll still continue to follow it. Um, it's just not lighting my world on fire, okay? And that's kind of my take on, you know, the Storm song. It's good. It's cool to hear Richie doing some of this kind of stuff. But, you know, Vintage Rainbow, it ain't, all right? From uh, Gemini, 2012-100-201-2-100. Do you think there should be a progressive rock category in the Grammys? I don't know if there is one already or not. I haven't watched the Grammys or any award show in several years. Um, there never has been a prog rock category at the Grammys, and there never will be. You heard it here first. This is not going to happen. Uh, prog rock to you know, 90% of the population in the world or in this country doesn't mean shit, unfortunately. And there's no need to have it. That's just, you know, plain and simple. If it ain't in the mainstream, they're not going to give it a category, okay? There's a reason why most of this stuff is all pop and hip-hop and, you know, 
do they do they even still have a hard rock category? I think they do. It's not even metal anymore. Uh, they have a jazz category. They have a blues, you know, and that sort of thing. But yeah, you're not going to see a prog. You know, as far as the you know the the Grammy committee is concerned, prog is like something that should have been left in the '70s, and it's a it's a weird, obscure byproduct of you know rock and roll or hard rock. That's 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 you know they don't even want to deal with it. So you're never going to see it. And my my um, suggestion to you is, you haven't watched the Grammys in years. Continue to not watch it. It's useless. All right, there's just nothing good going on there. From Matty Boy Walker. Pete, do you think there is more to Europe than just the final countdown and carry? I personally think their last few albums, like, you know, I'm not even going to get into everything else he's saying here, because this is a great question, Matty Boy. Um, <clears throat> and what the last part says, uh, their recent music is far away from their 80s sound as you can get. Also a fantastic live band, your thoughts. Okay, I didn't want to get into him mentioning the albums because I want to go there myself. So I've said this before. <clears throat> I'll say it again. And in fact, I even I went onto a little mini rant on Jeff Young's uh, Music Without Boundaries show like a month or two ago about this. Um, JeffYoungJams.com, go check it out. Uh, Europe is a phenomenal band, okay? And I think the vast majority of the heavy music fans out in the world, when they hear Europe, they think Final Countdown and Carrie, two, and I'm, I'm not saying they are, but. I'm not saying these songs are, but I'm saying that most people think, oh my God, I heard those songs a million times. What a shitty hair metal band. Never want to hear them again. And probably shortly thereafter, just refuse to give Europe any time whatsoever. Big mistake. Okay. Europe recorded, you know, albums kind of in that vein up until like the very early 90s. And then they, you didn't see anything from them for like about a decade. Okay. But since like the start of the 2000s, they've released albums like Walk the Earth, War of Kings, Last Look at Eden, Start from the Dark, Secret Society. Each one of those are great. Okay, Europe now, they're, they're far and away a totally different band than that kind of like, you know, curly hair, big teeth and smiles, singing these like, you know, radio friendly kind of pop rock tunes, whatever. Uh, and if you and if you hear the early Europe before the final countdown album, same deal. Great music. Okay. Heavy, heavy music. I mean, these guys, if you listen to their new music, it's plain and simple. They at their core love bands like Rainbow and Deep Purple and Thin Lizzy and Black Sabbath and UFO what it comes down to and their music is totally indicative of that style those crunchy Hammond organs the crazy blues rock you know crunchy blues rock guitar work of John Norum and Joey Tempest is a great singer and they're they're great live and the music is heavy it's dramatic it's moody it's dark final countdowns over here everything they've done since like 2000 is completely over here. So I'm telling you, if you learn nothing from this episode, you need to know that Europe is a fantastic band that deserves your attention. All right? Don't take my word for it. Go out, go here on YouTube, wherever, and listen to the album War of Kings. Listen to the album Walk the Earth. The others are great too that I mentioned, but those are those two most recent ones. Phenomenal. Heavy. Dark challenging music I'm telling you and classic sounding all right that is your homework for today people go and listen to some of the recent europe stuff in fact i think they're working on a new album as we speak you will not regret it okay i, I have been fighting this fight for europe for the for a bunch of years now you know forget the fucking final countdown forget carry all right listen to europe's music from the last two decades I'm telling you, it's great stuff. Thank you, Maddie, for that question. From Drum Music Inc., hey, Pete, thanks for another great show. My question involves the impressive array of CDs behind you. How is your music arranged so you can easily find stuff? By genre, band, and that pretty, and is that pretty much all of your CDs, or are there more? Keep up the great work. <laughs> uh, there's a lot more than what you see here. I have a whole closet full of them. So you know what? Let's do this, all right? I'm going to take you guys with me here. Bear with me. All right, so let's see. So this is how this is all set up. So everything is 
alphabetical by band. Okay, I don't have it by genre. It's just all alphabetical by band. So you can kind of go, you know, pop around here, see some stuff. All right, so here you got, you know, all the bees and Blackfoot and Birth Control, Black Sabbath, Jeff Beck, The Beatles, Barkley, James Harvest, Black Widow, Black Label Society, Blood Rock, Bowie, Boston, Blue Oyster Cult. I mean, you name it. And it kind of goes, you know, all the way over. You got, you know, Marillion, Magnum, Manfred Mann, Frank Marino, Steve Marriott, Marshall Tucker Band, Mastodon, Max Webster, Megadeth, Metallica, Metal Church. You know, over here you got some Symphony X, Seventh Wonder, Ten, Thin Lizzy, Styx. I mean, you know, the whole nine yards. So it's all... It's all alphabetical, as I walk back with you here. And, uh, yeah, I, I, it has to be that way. Because with this, I got like, you know, what, eight, 9,000 CDs, and I could never find anything if it wasn't set up this way. So in my closet, it's set up the same way. So everything in the closet, the only difference is in the closet, I have like all my extreme metal stuff uh, on a separate big shelf. Okay, I've kind of separated that out. But everything else down, the, the couple shelves down below is all alphabetical, you know, no genre or anything like that. So, um, yeah, so that's a little look into my stuff over there. From Bradley Y. Hey, Pete, thank you for answering my question. I know you've been asked questions about your t-shirt collection. I have a question regarding Black Sabbath, Mob Rules, and Heaven and Hell t-shirts. None of the official sites seem to sell them anymore. Is this due to Sharon and Ozzy? All right. Uh, I have stated this before, guys. Everybody watching this show has access to Google, right? I'm assuming. Just do a Google search. Black Sabbath Mob Rules t-shirt. All right? You'll get a wealth of vendors across the globe who are selling Mob Rules t-shirts. Do the same with Heaven and Hell. Stop thinking that the only place you can get t-shirts is in some official site somewhere. People make these shirts everywhere. You can get... I'm telling you, you can get any t-shirt of any album or band you like. Someone out there is making and selling it. I'm telling you. How do you think I got, like, all these hundreds of t-shirts that I have, right? It's, it's the, 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 you know, if the band ain't making them, all right, if they're not making them and not selling them, you can still find them. I know there's a lot of people out there who think, oh, I will never buy anything unless it's officially endorsed by the band. Well, if the band's not making them and you really want one, go fucking buy it somewhere. It's like, Jesus, it's, you know, so guys... You can find, I'm telling you, I, I saw your question, I went onto Google, and I found like a dozen sellers, whether on eBay or other, uh, you know, t-shirt sites, selling Mob Rules shirts and Heaven and Hell shirts. There, you can get any Sabbath album you want. Shit, I got a, I got a you know, I, I, have, I got a Born Again shirt, I got a Sabbath Bloody Sabbath, I got Volume 4, I got Heaven and Hell, I got, you know, so many of them. Never Say Die, all sorts of stuff. I'm telling you, it's out there. You don't have to search hard. Just telling you, go to Google, Black Sabbath Mob Rules t-shirt. Boom. And there you have a whole list of them. I'm telling you. Very easy. And they're not expensive. You can get a great shirt by a band you love, an album you love, for like 20 bucks or less, or you know, maybe 25 bucks. Usually not that much more than that. Ship right to your door. From Jamie Laszlo. <clears throat> I'm going to ask a question that could have easily been asked on Comic Book Geezers. Check out our sister channel, Comic Book Geezers, folks, if you like vintage comic books. Uh... What classic rock song do you think was used best in a Marvel movie? For me, it's pretty much a tie between Zeppelin's Immigrant Song in Thor Ragnarok and Fleetwood Mac's The Chain in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. That's a great question, Jamie. Um, that's a really good, great question. Okay, so first of all, your two picks are fantastic. I mean, I, I can't, I'm trying to remember like the last time I got so pumped up by hearing a song that I know in a movie as that scene in Thor Ragnarok right in the beginning where Immigrant Song kicks in. It's fucking brilliant, right? And I remember sitting there in the theater. <laughs> my wife is sitting next to me. And, you know, she doesn't know Zeppelin, Zeppelin songs from a hole in the wall, right? But then and, and that song kicks in, and I'm just like, yes! And she's looking at me like, yes, what? I'm like, come on, it's Zeppelin. It's the immigrant song. So, yeah, that's great. Uh, the Chain is also perfectly nestled in the Guardians of the Galaxy movie. However, for me, the best song in that Guardians of the Galaxy 2 movie is Brandy by The Looking Class, you know, right in the beginning of the film. Perfect. I mean, I love that song to death, as you all know. So that's a great one. Uh, Come and Get Your Love by Redbone in the first Guardians of the Galaxy movie. You know, those those two Guardians of the Galaxy films have a ton of great classic rock and R&B and pop and soul hits from the 70s. It's just it's great stuff. I love that they did that. Uh, the first Avengers movie, Shoot the Thrill by ACDC. 
you know, when that comes in, man, perfect time. Uh, but, you know, and one of my favorites, okay, is in the first Iron Man film, at the end of the movie where Tony Stark is up there and he announces to the world that I am Iron Man and then, boom, Sabbath kicks in, right, with Iron Man. How cool is that? So a lot of really good instances where Marvel picked out these, like, classic songs to fit perfectly in their films. Great question, Jamie. From uh, Nick Usofian. Hey, Pete, what's up? Uh, you know. Uh, I've been a fan of City Tranquility enjoy the, and enjoy the actual website. What do you think of Greatest Hits box sets? I know that some are contractual obligation, obligations like with Maiden, but some beauties like the four CD set of Captain Beefheart set, Sun, set Sun Zoom Spark 70 to 72. What do you think of these and do you have any items, gems in your catalog, in your collection? Uh, I, have a, I have a good amount of box sets. I've got, um, I've got that kind of Genesis Archives one. Is that what it's called? I got kind of like the yellowish, orangey, green cover with the photograph of the, you know, Gabriel Lair the band on the front. That's got a lot of really cool stuff. Uh, I've got a Journey box set. I used to buy box sets like crazy back in the 90s. Uh, I've got a really cool Bruce Springsteen one, which has like um, all sorts of like rare stuff on it. Um, Santana one. Uh, I've got a couple Gentle Giant box sets. It's like I, I, I just buy anything that Gentle Giant puts out. Uh, I've got a couple really cool King Crimson ones, you know, with all this um, like rare live concerts and things like that. Uh, I've got a, I think I have a few Jethro Tull ones, you know, like the, the 20th anniversary, the 30th anniversary, all that stuff. Those are cool. You know, those, those were noteworthy because the time before like all the, the wealth of remasters were flooding with all the, you know, the, the rare and bonus tracks being added on. The only way you can get those tracks was in the box sets. So I went and bought all those box sets and one of them has like the full Carnegie Hall concert. And then like, you know, they started remastering and reissued the Tull catalog again. Then all those tunes that I had on the box set that I would thought you can never get anywhere else. Now all of a sudden are all tacked on to the end of the remastered albums where, you know, those songs were recorded during those sessions. So whatever. Uh, I, I have a, I have a couple of yes ones, I think too. So all sorts of stuff. You know, I, I mean, it's, that was the thing in the nineties. I, I tend to shy away from box sets now, you know, unless I bought the, um, that's not true. I bought a couple of the Frank Zappa box sets. You've seen me do them here on the, on the, sh on the channel. Uh, you know, the, the rod, the expanded Roxy and the New York one. And I bought the recent, um, white snake 1987 box set with all the so they still release them i kind of pick and choose the ones that really make sense if there's something in there that i really have to have that you're not going to get anywhere else you know i'll go out and get it but like i i've thought about getting a lot of the recent uh jethro tull box sets you know with the stephen wilson remixing and the, you know the five cds and i I have a couple of them, but like I didn't get the Passion Play one and all the ones after that. I just haven't got. It's just where am I going to put them? They, they don't fit on the shelves. I'm running out of room as it is. So you know, um, and as far as like greatest hits, you know, a lot of greatest hits sets, especially back in the day, were definitely contractual obligations. You know, the band owed another another record. They're either broken up or it's in semi hiatus, and like let's just put out either a live album or a greatest hits set. And I I've made the mistake over the years many times of buying like a greatest hit set from a band that I kind of dig. I've heard some of their stuff and I'll get like a greatest hit set and then I'll really love it. And then I'll like, yeah, this isn't, I, I did it just recently again. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I bought, I had, I had a Tesla, uh, you know, like maybe 12 track hit set um, that I've had for years and years and years. I always liked Tesla. And, you know, I used to have uh a couple of their albums on cassette and, you know, whatever. But I decided like, you know, 10, 15 years ago to get like a greatest hit set. And then recently I was like, ah, oh, this doesn't have like half a dozen songs I really love. So instead of going out and buying like a couple of those albums, I went and bought a two disc hit set, which is killer. It's like a, a definitive collection or something like that, which is really, really great. Uh, it's got all the songs I really want out of it, but I'm just I'm just waiting until the day where I where I'm like you know what I I need to go out and get all those Tesla albums on CD. I'm like, uh, so but I generally try not to do that anymore because what usually happens is I'll, like I said I'll buy a hit set and then you know like a year later I'm like Ugh, there's so many other good songs besides what's on here and then I'll go and I'll give that away or sell it and I'll go out and buy all their albums. I've done that so many times, so I try not to do that. So like my greatest hits. Uh, I got a couple of cases full of greatest hits uh, CDs that has dwindled significantly in years because so many of those bands I've just gone all right time to ditch this and go buy all you know all eight of their albums or whatever so what are you gonna do all right from Arnaud B P 
Pete, what is the difference between Prague and Jazz Fusion? I ask the question because when I listen to Dixie Dregs, Bruford, Return of Forever, David Sanctius, PFM, John Luponti, Todd Rungman, Utopia, Salt Machine, National Health, or Planet X, the difference is not so obvious. Well, you're absolutely correct. So back in the heyday, so we're talking like, what, 70, you know, 70, 71, 72, 73, right about that time. <clears throat> Jazz fusion was was basically jazz guys playing prog rock, all right, or jazz guys just wanted to play rock and roll in general. I mean, if you go back to the kind of the roots of jazz fusion, you know, Miles Davis was a jazz cat, and he wanted to emulate like Jimi Hendrix. That's what he wanted to do. He was in love with Hendrix and wanted to do like kind of rock music, but he's still a jazz guy. So the music he created was a hybrid of the two. But I think as you, to, to your point, if you kind of move ahead a few years, so let's look at like, uh, you know, Tony Williams' Lifetime and Brand X and Return to Forever and Mahavishna, you know, bands like that, you know, maybe a little later on the Dixie Dregs, uh, you listen to that music and then you listen to like, you know, maybe Yes Relayer or National Health, okay, David Sanctus, you know, that type of stuff. Um, it's kind of all the same, right? The instrumental prog stuff doesn't sound much different than jazz, or at least what was you know being called jazz fusion at the time, and you know and it's and a lot of the prog bands were trying to you know the the reason why you know progressive rock was called progressive rock because it took the boundaries of rock music, threw in classical and jazz, and all of a sudden you got this thing they call prog rock, which again not very different than what the jazz fusion bands were doing. You know, you listen to like a Return to Forever album and then you listen to, you know, like uh, your, one of your examples, T Todd Rungman's Utopia, right? That first Utopia album. <laughs> a lot of similarities there, right? Other than, you know, no vocals, right? Take out the vocals. Not that much different. Not that much different. So very similar. And, you know, a, a band like Planet X, okay, Derek Sherinian's Planet X, you know, it's basically, pro There's not a lot of real jazz in Planet X, but definitely like that's, you know, if you go back, you know, Planet X, Lifetime, Return to Forever, Jean Luc Pont, not that different. Not that different, really. So yeah, a lot of those bands are very, very similar, you know. And is is it was it a was it a prog labeled a prog rock band because they had vocals and their players had no background in jazz? And was it a jazz fusion label band because some or more of the members played jazz prior and because the music has no vocals? It's a very interesting topic that we could talk about forever. Great question. From Gene Kirsten. Great show as always, Pete. Thank you, Gene. I have a question about early Fleetwood Mac. Back in about 1968, 1972, Peter Green was known as one of the best guitarists in the world. Absolutely. He started uh, taking acid and was seemingly becoming depressed before the incident in Munich, where he either took something or was dosed and became mentally ill. At the same time, Fleetwood Mac was one of the most popular bands in England. My question is, what do you think would have become of the band had Green not taken acid and become mentally ill? Uh, basically, Fleetwood Mac would never, the Fleetwood Mac that we know it today would never have happened. Okay? Rumors would never have happened. All right? That's, uh, that's basically what, what would have happened. I think if Peter Green did not take the drugs and kept the same sound mind like he had all throughout, you know, the Blues Breakers and the early Fleetwood Mac stuff, they would have continued to play, you know, blues rock, you know, maybe kind of uh, made it a little bit more mainstream. I'm assuming at some point they would have kind of uh, gotten a little more accessible, you know, and kind of changed with the times a little bit. But <clears throat> there would have been no need for Lindsey Buckingham and Stevie Nicks, right? And in my opinion, I think Fleetwood Mac would have always been known as a somewhat legendary band, but they would, have, in my opinion, they would never have ridden the heights of they did once, you know, they brought those two in to completely change their sound and became what they became. That's just my opinion. I think we always would have looked back on Fleetwood Mac as a great band, but not the mega legendary band that we know them as now. I just don't think that, you know, I think... If Green would have stayed in the band, you know, you wouldn't have probably wouldn't have had the Bob Welch era, right? Like I said, no need for Stevie Nicks and Lindsey Buckingham. So, and maybe they wouldn't have lasted as long. You know, who knows? Because uh, you know they've been they have been together since '68. So let's say you know Peter Green doesn't go eight batshit crazy and the band continues on. <clears throat> would they have petered out by '76, <clears throat> '77, you know, or whatever? Who knows? But I just, I don't think that that opportunity for those other two to join the band to help make them what they became, I don't think that would have happened. So, interesting scenario, though. 
All right, from Skalagrimmer Kvaltfulsen, our good friend. Hi, Pete. Great Q&A. Thank you for recommending that cool Attila album. Glad you like that. It's a pretty cool little album for all the bashing it gets. This time I have a question about Pink Floyd. Whenever I listen to them, I wonder if they should really be called one of the top progressive rock bands. They had a lot of atmospheric sounds and special effects, which I guess makes them kind of proggy, but I think a top prog band should also play fast and complex stuff inspired by jazz and classical music. I think Pink Floyd can never have written or played something like Tarkas or Siberian Kutru. Do you think they should have really be called a top prog band nonetheless? Thank you for your time. I mean, come on, let's, let's be real here. Not every band that's labeled a progressive rock band plays fast, technical, complex music that is inspired from jazz and classical. You know, I mean, look at, look at Genesis. While, yes, there is a lot of their music that's inspired by classical music, and they did have their moments, you know, for the most, most part, Genesis' music was very atmospheric and pastoral at times. I mean, there's not a lot of crazy, tricky time signatures. Sure, like I said, there is enough of it in there. Um, but, you know, not like a Yes or a Gentle Giant by far or a King Crimson, right? The Moody Blues, there's, there's hardly any jazz or complex parts to any of their music. You know, Camel, other than maybe their first, first two albums, you know, pretty melodic, atmospheric stuff. Fandegraph Generator, I wouldn't call a lot of them, you know, some of their music, yeah, it's chaotic, it's dissonant, but, you know, I, I when I listen to Fandegraph Generator, I hear like a totally different beast to like, you know, Yes, or King Crimson, or whatever. Caravan too, you know, not a lot of really, really fast music, you know, really tricky music. Um, and look at a lot of the Italian bands, you know, like Osana and Celeste. Latte Miele and a lot of others. I mean, they never really played fast, complex music, you know, but, you know, very symphonic music. That's the thing. There's a lot of prog rock bands that are just purely symphonic, but not technical and complex. Not a lot of time changes and meter changes and all that kind of stuff. Some of them know there's no jazz to be heard at all. You know, that classical influence, sure. So, you know, Pink Floyd... For me, Pink Floyd were always like the more mainstreamy of all the classic prog bands, okay? But, you know, a lot of their early music, that's pretty... You know, Pink Floyd, you got to understand, came from a purely psychedelic background. So that, that psychedelic element kind of always permeated their music, and then they started to become a little more, you know, rock-based and, and whatnot. But I, I don't think that you need to be influenced by jazz and classical and have elements of those two genres in the music to be to be considered prog you know prog can encompasses a lot of things so i i never had an issue with pink floyd being lumped in with the classic prog group because a lot of their music is pretty proggy but it's you know there's so much to what in take what, what entails being a prog band right from alex l if the stone zeppelin and the who are three best bands ever and they are all british who are the three best american bands ever and what are three or so best american albums in your opinion okay so this goes back to a previous questions and answers show where i you know talked about the three you know the three most notable rock bands on the planet in the history of rock and roll the stone zeppelin and the who i mean it's and they're all british right so let's so who are they from the us if we were to do us and britain so in my eyes the first two are pretty simple okay Aerosmith and Van Halen, that you get got to be in the equation, right? And we're talking rock bands, okay? And we're talking, and I and I want to talk about bands that kind of had an impact, longevity, that sort of thing. I don't want to talk about a band, you know. I'm, I hate to always bash on Guns N' Roses, but you know, Guns N' Roses released one huge album and a couple turds, and then and they're be they're considered like one of the best, you know. U.S. rock bands ever. I, I just don't get it, but whatever. So I'm not going to include them here. Other bands I consider. So we already know my top two. Uh, you know, Journey. Love them or hate them, you can't deny their impact on music for so many years. Grand Funk Railroad. Great American band. Mega huge for a number of years. Uh, the Eagles. Got to consider the Eagles. In fact, I might the Eagles might be that third band. But you know what? Leonard Skinner's got to be up there, too. All right, Kansas Sticks, ZZ Top. I know a lot of you guys hate Kiss, but Kiss, come on. You can't deny what they've done for music here in America. As far as albums, you know, we're talking about Aerosmith, you know, Rocks, Toys in the Attic, Van Halen, VH1, VH2, Fair Warning, classic albums. Grand Funk Railroad, you know, we're an American band, the Grand Funk album. A lot of great Grand Funk albums. Journey, Departure, Escape, Frontiers. 
Uh, the Eagles Hotel California, if for nothing else, right? Kansas left overture point of no return. Uh, ZZ Top, you know, their first three albums. The first album, Rio Grande Mud, Trace Hombres. Kiss, any of their first bunch of albums, but specifically, you know, Kiss Alive. Uh, you know, it, it's just, uh, it, it's kind of, you know, Skinner, the pronounced album, the first album, Second Helping, Street Survivors, all those early Skinner albums are great. But, I, you know, I would say if I had, if you had, if you put a gun to my head and said, you need to pick just three, all right, as far as like longevity and everything else and just the, the sheer amount of top songs, popular songs, best selling albums, you know, Van Halen, Aerosmith, and I guess, I guess Skinnerd. You know, the Eagles, just because they, you know, God, you know, Hotel California, the long run, and um, one of these nights, big selling albums. You know, Kiss is up there too. I don't know, it's hard. To, to pick the third one is really hard because you can make an argument for, you know, Grand Funk, Journey, Kansas, Eagles, Skinnerd, and ZZ Top, and Kiss. You really can't. But those, that's the cream of the crop for me. The biggest, you know, and some of you might go, well, what about Metallica? Yeah, I mean, you could say Metallica too, but Metallica is just not a rock band, right? T Metallica were always a metal band, and while I understand they were huge and, you know, transpired over a lot of different types of listeners, you know, and they're, they're still a metal band, you know, not a lot of hit singles and all that kind of stuff. I don't know. I mean, I guess you could lump Metallica in there, but I'm thinking like pure rock and roll. So Van Halen, Aerosmith, and all my other choices. Uh, good question, though. From Brandon Clark. Hey, Pete, I've been watching your shows for quite some time now. Well, I'm glad to hear that. I think you do an amazing job, and I recently discovered that Alice Cooper, Joe Perry, and Johnny Depp formed a group in 2015 called the Hollywood Vampires. I've never heard you mention them. Do you have any insight into this group? Yeah, I think I reviewed the Hollywood Vampires album when it first came out here on one of the What's Hot shows, but you'd have to go back into the archive. It's there. But, but anyway, just to give you a little back history. So, these three guys put together this band called the Hollywood Vampires to kind of uh, honor a group of dudes back in the 70s who called themselves or were called the Hollywood Vampires. Uh, they're all rock stars that used to hang out in the L.A. clubs and just get completely loaded and shit-faced together. That's what these guys were known. That's what these guys did, right? So Alice was one of them, okay? Keith Moon from The Who was another one. Uh, Harry Nilsson is another one. John Lennon and Ringo Starr from the ex-Beatles. Uh, Mickey Dolenz from the Monkees and Elton John might have been a couple others, but those were the guys. So when they weren't recording or touring or maybe in during tour, they, those guys would go get together in all, you know, the, the famous clubs in Los Angeles and just do all night bingers together. Okay, that's what they did. Uh, as you know, you know, a couple of those guys are no longer with us because of all that, right? So these guys, what they wanted to do is kind of put together this band as a kind of homage to those, you know, their fallen comrades that they used to hang out with and so on and so forth. This was, you know, Alice kind of came up with this idea. You know, Joe Perry and the guys in Aerosmith kind of probably were part of some of these back in the day. Um, so what they did was they did an album, and then they're, uh, you know, Johnny Depp is friends with a lot of uh, rock stars. So what they did was they put out an album. It's a decent one, too. It's a fun album uh, with a full, you know, Joe Walsh is on there, all sorts of... Like, Billy Gibbons is on there from ZZ Top, a bunch of other guys, and mostly covers, but a couple of original tunes, and the original tunes are good. They're good, you know? It's not that dissimilar from, like, the stuff that Alice Cooper's been doing. Uh, and then they, they play occasional live shows. I don't know if they've done any full-blown tours. I think they started a tour. Remember Joe Perry got, uh, had, like, a mild heart attack or something happened with him recently, so he had to step off the tour for a bit, but he's back. Um, but, you know, guys like, uh, you know, it's been Cooper and Perry and Depp plays live. Matt Sorum, you know, from Guns N' Roses plays drums. Tommy Hendrickson from Alice's band on guitar. Duff McKagan's helped out. Brad Wifford's helped out. A whole bunch of other people. So whether they do something else, uh, I, your guess is as good as mine. I'd, it'd be great to hear, like, another album of all original material, I think. And I think for a lot of, you know, um, Joe Perry fans because like, Aerosmith hasn't really done any much of anything of note in so many years. It's kind of cool to hear him on like a good rock album, right? So I think it'd be great to hear like another studio album of all original tunes, you know, with Alice and, and Joe and then the gang. And I think that'd be kind of fun because I like the first album. Our last question of the day is from Brian Nusser. Hey, Pete, love these questions and answer shows. Learning a lot, one hell of a lot in some cases. Not heard this mentioned, but a lot of talk recently, especially by one rock media individual critic of note wonder who that is, about the growing use of lip syncing, use of backing tracks, etc., by apparently a large number of classic bands on the road these days and not playing entirely live. What is your view on this? Well, you know, this has been uh, 
a topic, a hot topic, for a, a number of years. And I've seen a lot of concerts over the last decade or two where it's pretty evident that this is happening. Here's the, here's the issue. There's the core of people who are purists who they want to hear the bands actually up there playing. Whether they sound good or not, they want to hear honest live music. Then there's a lot of other people, probably a larger percentage, who they want to hear in concert what sounds closest to the records that they grew up with. Okay? So if the singer's not cutting it and you got backing tracks, or if uh, you know the songs had keyboards, but you don't have a keyboard player, and all of a sudden you hear all you know the keyboards pumping out there, um, and, you know people want the people want what's familiar, okay? You know I'm of the you know I don't mean I'm, there <laughs> there are certain like classic singers that I like a lot who you can tell over the last bunch of years have some help on stage whether it's backing tracks or the fact that the rest of the band, you know, the guitar players, the drummers, the keyboard players, uh, also sing, sing as well. And they sing backup and, you know, between the deficiencies of the lead singer coupled with the, all the extra backing vocals, it still sounds pretty damn good. Um, in my opinion, that's the best way to go about it. I'll use White Snake as an example. So, you know, Mr. Coverdale, I love him. You know, his voice has, has, has drastically changed over the years. And he's not able to hit a lot of those high notes that he used to. He still does a, 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 as good a job as he can as he's, you know, in his late 60s. But he's got, like, you know, a bunch of guys in the band now who also sing very well and help him out in the choruses and things like that. So it still sounds presentable. You know, David is singing a good majority of the show. And when he needs help, there comes in the bass player, or the, one of the guitar players or the keyboard player to kind of add that richness back that we want to hear, right? But on the other hand, you you know you have you have some bands who obviously it's all it, it's all pre-recorded vocals and they're just up there lip syncing. I'm not going to name names because I've heard some stories recently, okay, about very well-known acts and singers who are not singing at all during their live shows. I mean that's kind of troubling, you know. It, it, if you if you literally cannot sing at all and that you need to go up there and lip sync for an entire show, you, you need to find something else to do for a living. And those people who are doing this, they know who they are. I don't have to fucking name any names. Um, you know, but then you've also got, <laughs> you've got some other guys who are out there singing and just can't. I mean, they're just, it's just an abomination, them trying to sing these songs that they sang, you know, 40, 30, 40 years ago. And, it, you know, that's not a good experience for the listener either. You pay good money to go see a show and the guy's up there croaking away and, you know, we're forgetting lyrics and all. It's just like, oh, Jesus. So... Yeah, it's it's an issue. It's going to be an issue. You know, this is forever going to be the case. Because, you know, five, ten years from now, a lot of the guys that we all grew up with, they're going to retire. They're either going to pass away or they're going to retire. Then you got all the bands that came up in the 80s and 90s, and they're going to go through this too. They're all, it's going to happen to all of them. So it's going to be a vicious cycle. It's up to you, the concert goer, of whether you want to spend your hard-earned money to go see a band who either, you know, they can't sing for shit and they go up there and they sound like shit, or... They go up there, you know, they go up there and they're not singing at all. And it's just a, you know, a pre-recorded vocal line. It's up for you to decide. So, but yeah, this has been running rampant for a while and it's going to continue. So either get used to it or just stop going to concerts. That's, you know, that's really what you, the options you have. So that's our last one for today, guys. We're under 45 minutes. Gotta love it. This was a good one. We had some really good questions today. So keep them coming. Comments and feedback, put your questions in. I'll get to them. I'll pick out the ones I want to for the next go around. And uh, we'll see another questions and answers show in a week or two, something down the line. So this is on the web at www.seatranquility.org. We're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. Of course, we're on the mighty YouTube. Do not forget, Monday night, I will be guest hosting with Jeff Young, ex-Megadeth guitarist extraordinaire on Music Without Boundaries, jeffyoungjams.com. We're going to talk about all sorts of cool stuff. So 10, 11 Eastern Standard Time, 7, 11 Pacific Time. You don't want to miss it. But if you do, don't worry. As soon as the show is over, it's archived. You can go and listen to it the next day, the next week, whatever. Uh, Jeff and I are very excited about uh, doing the show together again. So look forward to that. Jeff is going to appear on this show very, very soon. Really looking forward to that. And uh, lots more stuff coming up. So stay tuned, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.